All right. Hey, everybody at Door Creek Church. How you guys doing? Um, I'm Tim Mackey, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of, of the Bible Project. And uh, you guys, uh, as a whole church, are going to be exploring the whole storyline of the Bible um, in your Sunday teaching series and other things you're doing there this year. And a bunch of you are going to try reading through the Bible this year. That's incredible. And so what we're going to do uh, with this teaching right here is kind of set you up for success so that as a church, you can journey through the whole Bible in 2017. Uh, I think the series that you're doing is called The Storyline. And that's awesome um, because that overlaps with a huge passion of mine. Uh, it's what the Bible Project uh, resources are all about, which is helping people see that the Bible is one unified story that leads to to Jesus. And that's actually the most helpful way to read the Bible because that's actually how it presents itself to us. Um, if you've ever tried to read through the Bible before, uh, my hunch is that you found it challenging. Um, not just because the thing is, you know, over a thousand pages long, um, but because it's a book that comes from uh, on the other side of the planet. It was written thousands of years ago in a language and culture radically different than our own. And so if you um, are kind of getting revved up to read the Bible for the first time all the way through, um, let me just offer you some just sober, sobering words. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. Um, and not because of some deficiency in the Bible, but just because of this big cultural gap that we experience from the Bible. Um, another reason I think that the reading the Bible is a challenge, especially for many modern Westerners, is because um, most uh, Americans, specifically uh, in church culture, come to the Bible with a bunch of pre-programmed assumptions about what the Bible is, and I think that those assumptions can sometimes short-circuit uh, our process of reading the Bible and actually end up being unhelpful to us. So let me just kind of address this real quick before uh, we get into the main thing of what this teaching is about, what this teaching is about, which is to tell the whole story of the Bible just in one teaching. Um, one of the ways that people get introduced to the Bible in uh, what I call churchianity, <laughs> uh, which is kind of the American form of Christianized church culture, um, is many people get exposed to the Bible in church gatherings, usually the Sunday worship gathering or Sunday school class. And because those gatherings, you know, tend to be, you know, a certain fixed amount of time, uh, what we end up doing is chopping the Bible up into pieces, into digestible pieces, um, and then they're packaged and given some sort of relevance or application for our lives. Now, that's not inherently wrong. I don't think church should be like a four or five hour ordeal. Don't get me wrong. Um, but my, my point is this. I think through years of being exposed to the Bible in little short chunks like that over a long time in a church community that can begin to program us in certain ways of approaching and reading the Bible. And it results in a few things, I think. It can result in the Bible... Uh, being viewed as some kind of divine behavior manual that fell out of heaven, whose main purpose is to tell you what to do and how to live. I think for many of us, we end up assuming about the Bible, uh, maybe that it's a personal love letter of God to me. And so uh, what the purpose of the Bible is, is for me to be able to have these devotional type encounters with it, reading 10 to 15 minutes at a time, and the goal is to have a deep time in prayer and to know that God loves me and I have the warm fuzzies or something like that. I think for others who are maybe more intellectually oriented, the Bible becomes this vast resource, uh, like a theological dictionary. And if I want to know what to believe, then I need to figure out what parts of the Bible to go to to shape my beliefs and so on. And so what we end up with is with large amounts of people in American churchianity who think of the Bible as a divine behavior manual, uh, a devotional grab bag, or some kind of theological dictionary or answer book. Now here's, uh, there's weaknesses, but there's also some things that are underneath there that are right assumptions. Uh, the Bible is supposed to shape and influence our behavior. That's one of its main purposes. The Bible is speaking a personal divine word to every member of God's uh, people. 
The Bible is trying to shape what we believe on the most fundamental and basic levels about who we are and what kind of world we're living in and who God is. But the question is how? Um, the Bible can do all of those things, but what we're asking is, is the Bible in its essence a behavior manual or a dictionary or some sort of potpourri bag uh, uh, or that you know, makes my heart feel warm and full of God's love? How does the Bible go about influencing my behavior, my beliefs, and sh speaking to me as an individual? And what I would like to do is just kind of help us reset our default mode of what we think the Bible is and what it's for. And when we actually honor what the Bible is and how it presents itself to us, I think that we'll discover the scriptures do all of those things, but in a way more profound and meaningful way. Let me just show you what I mean. Uh, you should see a slide appear here that has the very first words from page one of the Bible. And you'll also see uh, some words from the last page of the Bible, literally um, the last chapter and the second to last paragraph in the Bible. And I want you to just look at those. The Bible begins with the phrase, in the beginning. And in the second to last paragraph, where the whole storyline that was begun on page one ends, it ends with a sentence, and they, that is God's people, will reign forever and ever. Now, just stop for a moment, um, look at that, and t just tell me. Like, think to yourself, and then you tell me. What kinds of texts begin with a line in the beginning, and what kinds of written texts conclude with, and they will reign or forever and ever? What kind, of, what kind of book is the Bible as it presents itself to us by the beginning words and by uh, the concluding words. I mean, it's not hard to see. It's clearly a narrative. It's a, st a story. And uh, what kind of narrative? Well, obviously, it's not just a short narrative, right? It's thousands of pages long. Um, but also, this book came into existence over a period of, of uh, about 1,500 years. And so we're talking about a book uh, that's a certain kind of long narrative, and there's in, in literary scholarship and studies, there's a word, a category for this kind of thing. It's called an epic narrative. Epic narratives are long, long stories that are full of a cast of thousands or hundreds, or at least, that cover long periods of time, um, and there are many plot layers, there's plots and subplots and subplots of the subplots and so on. And also in epic narratives, there's also lots of different kinds of poetry and genealogies and other types of literature embedded within that grand epic storyline. Um, in the modern age, one of the most popular epic narratives uh, that's at least gotten public attention uh, is J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, The Lord of the Rings stories. So they're packaged up in three th large volumes. They're telling one storyline that has a long passage of time, many characters, lots of plots and subplots and so on. That's exactly the kind of story, uh, the way that the Bible is. Um, obviously, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, is fantasy, and the Bible is presenting itself as an account of the world that you and I actually inhabit in, in the real world. But it's an epic narrative none, nonetheless. Um, there are ancient versions of epic narratives that read much like uh, some of the biblical narratives. Uh, the works of Homer, if you've ever heard of the famous works of the Iliad or the Odyssey, they're very similar. So the Bible is an epic narrative made up of many different kinds of books, lots of different types of literature. It has poetry and genealogies and stories built in. But there's one controlling storyline that weaves throughout the whole thing. And I think part of what makes the Bible a challenge for many modern readers is that we just get lost in the details and in the subplots of the subplots. And we end up in a genealogy in the book of Chronicles and we're like five months into a read through the Bible and you're just like, I'm over it. It's just this thing, boy, this thing is way too long. So here's uh, what I wanna do. In the Bible Project, we've created lots of resources, specifically in the forms of videos and a Bible reading app called Read Scripture to help you see the st big storyline at all times and read through. But in this teaching, with the time we have left, 
I just want to quickly give you big categories for the movements of the overall storyline of the Bible, because it's pretty simple to see. Uh, and it's very help helpful to see how it fits together. I've drawn them behind me on this whiteboard, and we're kind of going to fill it in and read some biblical text. But uh, there you go. How you guys doing? Are you with me? You ready? The storyline of the Bible in like 20-ish minutes. Can we do it? I think we can. Um, so here's a simple way to think about it. Uh, page one of the Bible is a story about, uh, it's, it's an ancient Israelite, it's a Hebrew account of uh, what scholars call today a cosmology. It's a way of thinking about what kind of world we're in, who's behind it all, why are we here, what's the purpose of all of this. Um, we typically call this the story of, of creation. Uh, it's not primarily trying to tell us details, this is a huge debate of course, uh, about the physical processes by which the material universe came into existence. Um, this author lived thousands of years ago uh, and had a very different set of categories for all those questions than we do in the modern world. But all the same, it is giving an account from an Israelite point, ancient Israelite point of view about what kind of world we're in and uh, how we got here. And essentially, this is just the most simple way to think of the storyline of the Bible. It begins with uh, creation, and God turns a dark, watery chaos into a beautiful garden. That's essentially page one of the Bible. And of course, we know the garden only lasts about like two pages in the storyline, and everything, uh, everything goes horrible. But the main plot line, overarching narrative arc of the whole storyline of the Bible, is how God made the world, how humans have given in to evil and participated in the ruin of God's good world, and so the whole arc is for God to bring about a new creation that is healed and restored from all of the horrible things we've done to the place and to each other. So on the largest level, the storyline of the Bible is a story of creation to new creation. Now that sounds very simple. Um, an interesting way to do this is just to read the first two pages of the Bible and then skip to the end and read the last two pages of the Bible. And you'll see huge amounts of overlap, lots of identical phrases and images and ideas. That's clearly the big story arc, is God's taking our world uh, somewhere new that's healed of every, all the evil uh, that's happened to God's world. But of course the Bible has a lot more to say than just that. It wants to offer us an account uh, of how we ended up in the world that you and I inhabit, and then telling the story of what God has been doing to bring about and restore the creation. So, um, you guys with me? That's just a very simple way, from creation to new creation. But let's dive in a little, a little deeper to see how the storyline works. So the story begins with God uh, bringing order and beauty and a garden out of the chaotic, watery desert wasteland um, that you find in the opening sentence of the Bible. And what God does is he creates this cosmic garden temple, and he installs his images in the temple. Um, Israel, the people of Israel were never to make images of God uh, that would reduce God to something physical within the created realm. And so while humans in Israel were not to make images of God, God can and does make images of God's own self, um, that is namely you and the person sitting next to you right now. Um, the opening page of the Bible tells us that God created the world that we're a part of, that he packed it full of potential and energy, and all of that is to be ruled by his images. The key sentences, you'll hear them, uh, you'll see them appear on the screen here, are this. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock, the wild animals, all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So here's the idea that God creates this whole world for the purpose of sharing it. And what, how we, who he wants to share it with is his image-bearing creatures, namely humans. 
And specifically, what he appoints his images to do is to rule. So the image of God isn't something that humans possess, at least not according to the Bible. It's something that human beings are. It has to do with our role and purpose and vocation in the world. And that is to rule and steward and oversee God's good world on God's behalf. If God's the creator and king of all things, then how is it that God wants to assert his rule over his creation? And page one says, through you, through human beings. Um, and what they're going to do is rule the world, male and female, together as one humanity reflect the image of God. And God says, go multiply like rabbits, you know, make more of yourselves, uh, subdue, harness all the potential in this world, make neighborhoods, families, gardens, spread, you know, and take the potential in the creation and pull it out into new combinations and new directions and so on. That's the commission given on page one of the Bible. And that sounds awesome. It sounds like paradise. And apparently it was. And it lasts for about two pages in the storyline of the Bible. And where the storyline of the Bible immediately goes is to give an account, um, not just of our purpose, but also of how that purpose got perverted or distorted to end up in the circumstances in which you and I find ourselves now. So this is what I call uh, the fallout. And essentially, page three of the Bible tells of the spiraling crash and burn, the fallout. So page three of the Bible tells of how the human beings give in to evil. God placed a choice in front of the humans on page two about good and evil. It's represented by these trees. Um, human beings are going to have to make decisions about what is good and not good if they're going to rule the world on God's behalf. And so the question is, will the humans trust and depend on God's wisdom to define good and evil, or Will they take from the tree and seize the opportunity to define good and evil for themselves and rule the world by their own self-defined terms? That's what's going on with this uh, thing about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, you know how the story goes. The human beings give in to a source of evil that is outside themselves, uh, this image of the snake, tempting them, distorting God's words. But then at the same time, they give in to it and they choose evil and it immediately fractures their their relationship, um, the first casualty of human rebellion against God is that the man and woman's relationship is uh, torn apart. And then the whole story just spirals out of control. Their family gets torn apart through murder and violence. And then uh, the first cities, it's this ancient account of the origins of civilization. Cities are built where violence reigns. There's a poem about a guy who's like murders people just for you know, uh, slapping him. And uh, the whole story spirals out of control. All humanity is violent. There's injustice. God washes it clean with the flood, but then that still doesn't prevent humanity from uh, ruining and destroying themselves and God's world. And so the whole thing culminates. This is the whole story of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. The whole thing culminates in the stories uh, specifically about the city and the tower of Babylon. And you're going to see why that's significant in a second. And the people of Babylon come together and they say, we're going to use our technology and build a city and a tower that reaches up to the heavens. If uh, the rebellion began with human seizing independence from God, now humanity wants to unite and ascend up to the realm of the gods, right, to the heavens, and assert their own divine authority through technology and power. And so God does the same thing, just as he banished the humans from the garden, he scatters the people of Babylon. And so you finish Genesis chapters 1 through 11, and you're just like, what hope is there for God's good world? What is God going to do to bring about the new creation? Because we know that that's where the story is going, but how? And this is where the story of the Bible takes a really interesting turn. The first chapters of the Bible have this huge universal focus. It's a long periods of time and it's all these different nations and large amounts of people. And then in Genesis chapter 12, this is where the story turns right here. Genesis 12, uh, the story focuses in onto one man and his family. And that's uh, the man Abraham and then his family that comes from his line, which is uh, the family of Israel. 
And what God does is he uh, approaches Abraham, and you're going to see these words uh, appear here on the screen. He says these words, r remarkable words. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, just pause. Um, whatever, uh, this is just a basic Bible study skill, just by word count alone, what's the key idea and repeated idea here in these words of God to Abram? Blessing, right? Blessing. God's going to bless this guy, make him a great nation, make his name great, bless it, bless him. So, But what for what purpose? Why is God choosing this random guy from among the scattered nations out of Babylon to bless him? What's the purpose? And the purpose there is in that last line of verse 3, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Now think about the story here. What do we know about the families of the earth? They are in rebellion against God. That's what the families of the earth are and do. They're rebels. And they're ruining each other and they're ruining God's world. And that's the result of the fallout. But what God does here in Genesis 12 is he sets in motion a long-term plan to do what? To bless his enemies. God wants to bring about new creation by somehow using this one man and his family to restore his divine blessing to the rebellious nations of the world. Um, it's sort of like uh, what Jesus said the character of the Father is, uh, which is to send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And for Jesus, that's the motivation for loving and blessing your enemies. Where did Jesus get that idea from? From reading his Bible. It's exactly how God's portrayed here in Genesis chapter 12. He sets in motion a plan to bless his enemy because he loves his creation too much to abandon it. And so begins on page 12, essentially of the Bible, the main Old Testament storyline, which is about God and the people of Israel. And so here's how this story goes. Uh, this story runs throughout most of the Old Testament, which is basically three quarters of your Bible. It's very long and very complicated. And this is where all the subplots of the subplots begin. Um, it's, but here's essentially how the story goes. I'm just going to break it out, break it out up here. It begins with the story of uh, Abraham and his family. And what God does with Abraham is make a series of formal uh, promises or covenants that somehow through Abraham and his family, he's going to bless all the nations of the world who are rebellious, by the way. So here's what happens is that once Abraham's family grows and becomes really large, um, they end up enslaved by another bad empire that's just as bad as Babylon. It's like a new Babylon. Uh, it's the, the people and the king of Egypt. And so they end up enslaved in Egypt. And what God does is in the story of the Exodus, he confronts the evil of the nations and he defeats it. That's the main point of the Exodus story through the ten plagues. And you've probably seen the movie and so on. And so what we learn here is God is on a mission to defeat evil among the nations. What he wants to do is bless them. But if the nations are going to be set on perpetuating violence and evil, he will defeat their, uh, their evil in kind. But that's all a part of his ultimate plan to rescue a people and to restore blessing to the nations. So he brings the people, uh, redeems them. This is where the word redemption comes from in the Bible. He redeems them out of slavery. And he brings them to the foot of a mountain called Mount Sinai. And here, God enters into uh, another covenant relationship, not just with Abraham, but with the whole family, the whole people of Israel. And essentially what he asks the people of Israel to do, you're going to see this appear on the screen. Uh, this is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 and following. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what he's calling uh, the family of Israel to be is a whole nation of priests. Priests are people who are go-betweens between God and people. 
So he's calling the nation, the family of Abraham, to be this go-between, between God and the nations. God wants to represent his character and purposes to the nations, and the whole people of Israel are supposed to be his representatives or priests. And this is where all of the laws of the Old Testament fit in. The laws, there's 613 of them in the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy, and they are the terms of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. If Israel obeys these laws, they will be faithful representatives and therefore God's priest to all of the nations. How does that story go? Well, as you read on in the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, what you see is that Israel uh, goes into the promised land, they get their own kingdom, and it all just goes horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> and just like all humanity was given a basic command to trust God to define good and evil, and they rebelled, and the fallout was uh, leading up to Babylon. So Israel here was chosen out of among the nations, redeemed from slavery, given the gift of a covenant relationship with God. They're given the opportunity to go into their land, and how do they do? They, re they replay the sin of Adam. And so they end up replaying the fallout, and they have their own uh, fallout, and they are exiled to the very nation uh, that was at the climax of humanity's rebellion to Babylon. Israel rebels and ends up in captivity in Babylon. And that's essentially the basic storyline of the main part of the Old Testament. And so the big question is, what's going to happen now? We have a rebellious humanity. God redeemed one family, but now that family that he called to be priest of the nations are rebellious, and they've ended up exiled in the very place where this whole mess came to a head. What is God going to do? And this is where the prophets of the Old Testament come into play in the storyline. So it's one-third of the Old Testament. And the prophets essentially say this. They accused Israel while, they, while the ship was going down. And they said, listen, this is a mess of your own making, and you're going to go into exile into Babylon. But God's going to renew his covenant. On the other side of exile, he's going to send a king called the Messiah, a king from the line of David, and that Messiah is going to be the one who will lead Israel into truth faithfulness. So the prophets are pointing to this king from the line of David who will come. And essentially the Old Testament story comes to an end and the king never comes. We turn the page to uh, the opening books of the New Testament and you're going to see appear here a line from the opening paragraph of the Gospel according to Mark. And we see Jesus presented to us, Mark chapter 1, verse 14. And we're told that Jesus appears in Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. And what is Jesus' basic message? It's that the time has come, and that the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this good news. Jesus' basic message was that he was that promised king uh, from the family of Abraham, uh, who would come to lead and be the representative of the covenant family of Israel and do for them what they were not able to do for themselves. And so we enter into this section of the story that I call Jesus and the Kingdom. And the four Gospels tell the story of how Jesus called Israel to follow him, but paradoxically, the leadership of Israel, thousands of Jews followed Jesus and became his followers, but the leadership of Israel ended up rejecting him just like they rejected uh, their covenant in the storyline of the Old Testament. And so what the leaders of Israel do is they end up crucifying their own messianic king. And what Israel's doing in that moment is they're embodying and replaying once again the rebellion of uh, the created creation against its creator. And all of humanity's evil and Israel's evil comes rushing up into this moment where the creator enters the story in the person of Jesus, where God becomes the human that we are all made to be but perpetually fail to be. So Jesus comes announcing God's kingdom and saying the whole human story is being fulfilled right now in me and in what I'm doing. He calls people to a new way of being human through his teachings and the Sermon on the Mount. But ultimately, 
Israel is so confronted by their own corruption that they murder the Creator and they murder their King. And, but paradoxically, this ends up being, the cross ends up becoming the very place that's the gateway into the new creation. Because God's justice, God loves his world, but, but he can't just ignore all, right, all of the injustice and the violence uh, that humans have perpetuated in it. But what he wants to do is not destroy his world, he wants to bless it. And so the cross is the place where God's purpose to bless and his purpose uh, to fulfill his justice meet together. And instead of destroying humanity and his whole creation, he absorbs humanity's evil and the consequences of our evil uh, into himself on the cross. The cross is the place where this God's love and justice meet together and where the judge becomes judged. But that's, of course, not the end of the story. Uh, three days later, something surprising happened uh, that none of the followers of Jesus saw coming, and that's that Jesus was vindicated as Israel's king. He was raised from the dead. And this was something that the followers of Jesus could then look back and read through the Old Testament scriptures and see, like, oh my gosh, this is where the story was always going. But they wouldn't have had eyes to see it beforehand. This was how God was going to rescue and redeem his world. And this was how God was going to bring about the new creation, by joining himself to humanity and becoming the human that we are all made to be, but that we fail to be. Jesus has been that one on our behalf. And so he walked into the, through the curtain of death, that's the consequence for all of our evil in the world, and he went out the other side for us and on our behalf. And so the basic message of the New Testament is that Jesus became what we are so that we can become what he is. Someone who uh, died for the sins of the world, but who, uh, for whom evil and death didn't conquer him. They were raised from the death, raised from the dead through God's love and God's life. And so the message of the New Testament is essentially to see Jesus as the truly human one, the God man in whom my humanity finds its true destiny. And we're invited to lay down at the cross and to turn from all of the subhuman, corrupt ways of living and treating other people and not loving our neighbor as ourselves and allowing all of that to fall at the foot of the cross and to embrace uh, the love of Jesus for us because he died and was raised for us and that Jesus is now present with all of his followers through the presence of his spirit. And right now, Jesus' followers find themselves in this kind of in-between space where Jesus really did bring the kingdom and he really did guarantee the hope of new creation by his resurrection from the dead uh, but we are now in what you could call this already, the kingdom is here, but it's not yet fully fulfilled. And that will only happen when the king returns and when God brings about the new creation. And so the story of the New Testament is the story of how Jesus' followers are called to become these new humans uh, that Jesus was on our behalf and that he wants to make his people into. And that you and I as his disciples live in the present as if the new creation truly arrived in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And the way that the whole story ends is with creation being healed of all of the evil and all of the pain that we've inflicted upon it. And God becomes all in all, and his love and creative purposes uh, get the final word. So there you go, you guys. That wasn't too painful, was it? It's the story of creation to new creation, through the story of Israel, fulfilled in the story of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Um, there's a lot more to it, but I think there's just something, uh, a beauty in the simplicity of that basic narrative right there. The Bible is an epic narrative. You're going to find yourself challenged and confused. Um, the teaching team at Door Creek, uh, the resources we've made through the Bible Project, we want to help you as much as we can. Uh, but we hope that as you journey through the storyline of the Bible this year, uh, you find your imagination captivated uh, and that your heart is captured uh, by the purpose and the love and the pursuit uh, that this God has for the broken people, including you and me, of this world. 
So I'm really excited for you guys and for this year. I hope uh, all the best for you. Um, I'm going to be there at Door Creek in a few months, and we're going to spend a weekend together doing some fun stuff. I'll see you guys later, but all the best to you. Thanks, you guys. If you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right. And this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises, and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great. So what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him, promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel in obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the new covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who was able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David, and so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. 
So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who were becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning.